It's Friday. We are slipping even further into uh, madness. Madness. <laughs> I'm Ian Trevethan, I think. Last I checked, I am the Education and Outreach Manager here at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. It is time for our morning, morning, live feed on Facebook. We're here at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. We are bringing the dome to your home. Or you might be bringing your home to the dome. I don't know what's going on anymore. Um, Anyways, today I am with our naturalist and resident reptile whisperer, Alicia. She is Hello. currently she is currently whispering sweet nothings into our friend's ear here. He doesn't like it. And he is whispering sweet nothings right back. <laughs> so today's subject, I better put this somewhere safer, I don't spill it. So today's subject matter is monitor lizards and mosasaurs. So for the sake of everybody's sanity, let's look at our friend, the water monitor. So what we've got here is a Merton's water monitor who is extremely thrilled to be here this morning. Can you hear that? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh. Oh. Get that thing closer to me. You're okay. It's, it's okay. So does this one have a name, Alicia? This one is Rex. So this is Rex. I left Raptor upstairs. Raptor's so, a lot not as calm. <laughs> so this is this, this is, is the calm, calm one. one. So what we've got going on here is this is a Merton's water monitor. And this kind of represents sort of the more primitive point, but I won't say the starting point of Mosasaur relationships and and I'll clarify that statement here in a, in a little while, but Because we want to talk about our water monitor first and our water monitor is you can tell kind of grumpy because it's morning And nobody wants to perform live in the morning, especially when it's been so quiet here um, But let's let's look is there a way is there a way we can successfully sort of show how the body structure works here? Tell me what you want. Well, uh, just just hold it up so we can see sort of the length of the body. Thank and, you pooped on me. Oh, good. Oh. So you see how actually that that movement is happening. That's how that's how a water monitor would actually sw swim through the water. And what would happen is they would actually tuck out. They would actually tuck their their arms and legs against their body. I'm not going to make them do that. He just wants to scratch. He right? just wants to run away right now. Oh, so man. this is kind of neat because. Whoop. Oh. And there we have there we go. biology <laughs> in real time. Better you than me. What? Oh. <laughs> so um, I love my job. <laughs> I love your job too. Thank you. Getting, getting pooped on it here at the Sternberg Museum. So I, ah, that's just nasty, uh, bro. Oh, he's going at it still. <laughs> All right. So I can't remember what I was going to say, but there you have it. Uh, live television kids or whatever this is anymore. I don't know. I love the 21st century. Um, do you feel better, buddy? No, no. no. <laughs> and if you get too close to me, I'll do it on you. Um, <laughs> I'll point at this time. No. <laughs> point at me because I'm wearing a light color. You could totally, it would match. Um, so, man, I can't remember what I was saying. There's nothing like a big poop to totally side. Something about his driving. body movement. All right. So his body movement, we would call this sort of a pythonomorph almost shape or body movement. And one of the things he's got in common with our fossil reptiles, mosasaurs, is sort of the shape of his vertebra or vertebrae. Um, they're very sort of ball and socket. So that allows them to do this sort of cool motion. So for everybody's sanity, I'm gonna let you put our monitor lizard away. Everybody say goodbye and thank you for sharing. <laughs> everywhere. He, he yeah. seems calmer now that he's well, now that poop. You know. Yeah, now, now that we said that he can go, he's going to be like, hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait, I like wait, the wait, camera. This is cool. <laughs> um, so let's just take a good look at, at the form, the body let's form. Take a look at the good now, tail. You'll notice that he's got fairly long arms and legs and fairly long toes. So let's pivot around, Rachel, and look at the fossil mount behind you. 
That is disgusting. Gross. So what we've got going on here is this is a platycarpus, uh, which is sort of, there are three or four common mosasaurs in western Kansas that we often find. Um, there is a Clydastes, which represents a sort of the smaller bodied mosasaurs. There are the platycarpus or platycarpines, which um, are sort of generally the medium sized bodied mosasaurs. And then we had the Tylosaurus, which is the larger bodied sort of apex predator uh, of um, the chunk of time that our rock represents, which is roughly between, I would say, 70 to 80 million years, give or take, not exactly, because, you know, there isn't an exact in geological time. You know, we, we have to sort of think in larger generalized chunks. Um, so these animals lived about that time period, what we would call sort of the, the late Cretaceous period between 70 and 80 million years ago. And, you know, there were some that were a little bit older, and then there were some that were probably a little bit younger geologically. Um, but generally, those are the, the animals that we find in Kansas. Uh, there's also another kind of mosasaur called an Actenosaurus, um, which looks to me a lot like, like a platycarpus. Um, and... Um, We'll be looking at his skull here in a minute. But one of the things I want to point out is if you look at the skull of this particular fossil mount, it's a little misleading. And so I wanna, I wanna take care of this right off the bat. This is not anatomically correct. Um, this fossil mount was the, the person who was putting this together, and I'm not sure if it was somebody um, under the Sternbergs or if it was one of the Sternbergs, I don't think it was. It doesn't look like uh, a Sternberg mount to me, but it looks like a similar process. But anyways, whatever, whoever the individual was, um, this was put together so that it could be viewed and it's not necessarily anatomically correct. So one of the things that that is going on here is they have the lower jaws splayed out to the side. Uh, and I think mostly that's because they wanted the public to be able to see these really cool jaws and the bones that connect them to the skull. Uh, but the mosasaurs were not able to detach their jaws or move them around like a snake does. So sometimes this particular fossil mount is a little misleading because when we start talking about what we call streptostylic skull bones, you know, bones that move around in the skull, um, people will see this and go, oh, wow, did, were they able to actually move their jaws around kind of like a snake and detach their jaws? Um, no, is the answer. It wasn't as dramatic as this looks. The reason that it's put together like this is so people can see how those jaw bones looked, but not necessarily how they looked in life. So you can marvel at the bones, but don't <laughs> don't get that confused as how it would have looked in life. So let's kind of go along just from the nose to the tail. Uh, this animal is, I would guess, about 20 feet long-ish, maybe 25 feet. It's, it's closer to 20. I think it's closer to 20. It's, it's, it's about 10 feet shorter than our Tylosaurus on display on the other end of the museum. And <clears throat> again, this is what I would sort of term as a medium-sized mosasaurs. So mosasaurs share two common relatives, and we've kind of talked about this before. We touched on that on, I think, our first day of, of live casting, but because we specialize in marine reptiles and mosasaurs are definitely right in there with one of the, the coolest marine reptiles, in my opinion, we're probably going to talk about Mosasaurs again and again and again. There's so many things you can talk about with these animals. But today we're kind of going to just sort of focus on what mosasaurs were, who their living relatives are, and kind of some ideas of what the, I guess, the, the 
evolutionary process may have been. You know, of course, we can't observe these things in real time. All we've got are, are fossils and some of their living relatives. So the living relatives of mosasaurs today are what we call varanid reptiles or varanid lizards. So that includes things like Komodo dragons and monitor lizards. And our Merton's monitor itself. And our Merton's monitor. So that's why I had our monitor lizards out this morning. Uh, and the other modern relative is a snake. Now, this is where the discussion really kind of heats up because there's, it's about as clear as mud as to which one of these forms came about first. Um, you'll remember earlier that I sort of hesitantly referred to the water monitor as sort of the primitive representative, but not necessarily the first representative of a Mosasaur, rep, uh, a Mosasaur relative. So I've got Dr. Reese Barrick here with me. Um, thank you for that rousing revelry. I am, I'm roused. <laughs> no, don't say that. <laughs> what? Are you not roused? I'm not awake. Um, so, uh, coffee must be kicking in then. Um, so what, help me explain what I mean by our monitor lizard being, or representing a primitive relative, but not necessarily the first relative. What am I saying here? That sounds like I've just lost my marbles, and maybe I have. Well, the, 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 what we're looking at is we have modern animals that are living representatives in relations to fossil uh, uh, animals. And so we have uh, what oftentimes as scientists, what we're trying to do is find common relatives to find out the evolutionary relationships of animals that are around today. And so we know that uh, monitors, lizards, and snakes are somewhat closely related to each other relative to lots of other lizards. And um, so at some point in time, they may have shared a common ancestor. Hmm. And so there were, we know, for example, uh, the, the earliest snakes had legs. Hmm. And we sort of talked about that yesterday when we were talking about our non-venomous snakes too. And the earliest snakes come from around 167 million years ago. So that's when the it's Jurassic. The Jurassic, yeah. Right, which is a long time ago. But the, the funny thing where it gets all confused is before about 10 years ago, the earliest snakes that we knew about came from the Cretaceous and they lived in the marine realm. So mm -hmm. they were, they were the earliest ones lived in the ocean. So they were sea snakes, basically. They were sea snakes. And they showed up about the same time the first mosasaurs did. Mm -hmm. um, and at that same time, some of the, the early varanid lizards were running around on land. So we had varanid lizards on land, we had some of the earliest snakes in the water, and we had mosasaurs that kind of looked like snakes and kind of or looked like of varanid mosasauroids lizards. Mosasauroids or whatever you would call them. Not quite mosasaurs as we see right. them in our museum, but the early forerunners yeah. of these sort of mosasaur-looking yeah. critters that were... Was it Dallasaurus? Dallasaurus. Uh, uh, there's another one like uh, Igelosaurus or Igelosaurus. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, that, that sort of, to me, looked actually a lot closer to what a water monitor might look like. You know, had still some, some longer arms and legs. Mm -hmm. um, the, the arms and legs were not as reduced. Um, you know, I haven't had a chance to really study a skull of an early mosasauroid type thing, but so you know, you know we, we had we had animals around. And some of those early marine snakes still had some back legs to them, but no mm -hmm. front legs. Mm -hmm. The early mosasauroid things had four limbs, and the varanids were up on land, and they weren't even they were ancestors to our modern monitor lizards, but they were still different. Our our actual monitor lizards didn't show up till towards the end or the right. beginning of the Cretaceous. So, so let's actually, I kind of jumped the shark or the Mosasaur as the case may be. Let's stop and talk about what exactly a Mosasaur is. So let's look back at our Mosasaur for a second. And let's talk about why Mosasaurs are kind of a unique thing. First of all, Mosasaurs are categorized as a varanid reptile. So we recognize enough similarities between them 
and some of the modern varanid reptiles that uh, we can kind of categorize them in the same um, in the same group. Um, so there are some some several features that um, sort of unite these animals and varanids. And I saw how do we know that snakes are closely related to uh, mosasaurs? What about the skull morphology? And that's where I'm actually slowly and clumsily leading to ham handedly. <laughs> because not enough coffee yet. Um, there are actually similar features in the skulls of mosasaurs, varanid reptiles, and snakes. And I'll kind of get into that here in just a minute. So I'm, I'm getting there, I promise. But uh, the thing about mosasaurs is they were uh, aquatic, full-time marine reptiles, which means they did not come out of the water. Uh, for a long while, there were some ideas that maybe marine reptiles would come out on land like sea turtles do to lay their eggs and then would just return to the, to, to the ocean and that's how they would reproduce. But since then, we found a lot of fossil evidence that uh, supports that pretty much all the marine reptiles um, that we, you know, plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, ichthyosaurs, um, gave live birth in, in shallow waters. There's no fossil evidence that they did come up on land. And when you look at a mosasaur, I think it's probably unlikely that if a mosasaur were to wash up on shore, um, you know, this is a medium sized mosasaur, but even so, you know, this is an animal that's used to being in a, a relatively weightless environment. And if it were to get washed up on shore, it would have a hard time breathing and sort of supporting its, its vital organs. Um, under its own weight, and I think it would probably suffocate. So these animals are definitely not specialized to be on land. So that opens up a whole new can of worms because reptiles are generally, at least the ones we see today, are not renowned uh, for their ability to keep a constantly warm body temperature internally. Uh, a lot of reptiles we observe today come out um, you know, after the sun comes up, uh, or in the case of captivity, they come up and they, they sit under a heat lamp and they rely on external heat to warm their bodies up to be able to do the, the body functions like digestion and moving around and all that kind of stuff. Mosasaurs and, and similar marine reptiles didn't have that luxury. So they were in an environment, even though the oceans were probably warmer than they are today. Um, water is is constantly sapping body heat. And so these animals had to come up with some pretty unique ways to sort of combat that natural occurrence of water sort of sapping an animal's body heat. And even, like I said, even in you know, tepid bath water temperatures, that's still occurring. So. It's kind of an interesting thing to think about that, that an animal that we traditionally think of as, for lack of better words, cold-blooded, which is a terrible word uh, or a terrible description, but it's something that we're all familiar with, so it's a starting point, um, you know, that these animals are, are often seen relying on external sources of heat to warm their bodies. So these, these animals are doing something a little bit different. So... Um, I feel like I've been talking a lot, so I'm gonna let Reese talk a little bit as well, since he was my mentor in understanding physiology of these animals and figuring out ways to come up with uh, plausible body temperature estimates. So, yeah, how did you figure that out? Uh, I showed up <laughs> at a museum once and this guy said, hey, have you ever thought about doing this? And the truth is I hadn't, and then I started thinking about it and I've never stopped. Wonder who that could be. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things that you can do to look at body temperatures of animals is you can use what we have called stable isotopes, and you can use the bones to figure out essentially temperature variability within a bone. And so, Ian did this with some different mosasaurs and found out that the temperature variability a mosasaur went through was relatively small. Um, so if they were having the heat sapped out of them at all of the time that seasonally they should go through a fairly large range of body temperatures and it didn't seem like they did that 
which has strongly suggests that they had a relatively constant body temperature, even though they're living in an environment where their temperature should vary quite a bit. Well, and yeah, especially if these animals were migratory, which we do think they probably were. Uh, and if you think about even the interior seaway, so uh, we should really do a segment that talks about what the Western interior seaway was, because it was very unique. But if you imagine North America, pretty much like it is now, that land mass, and if you imagine sea levels rising and then sort of this, this narrow-ish, sort of relatively shallow seaway, uh, estimates range depending on regression and transgression of the seaway. Um, it could have been between 1,000 feet and 600 feet deep at any given time, depending on, and this is what, what's tough about living systems is it's never static, it never sits still. So this seaway was constantly oscillating, regressing and transgressing, getting deeper, getting shallower. And getting so, narrower and wider. It and, could go yeah. from, from basically the Kansas-Missouri border all the way to halfway through Utah to other times. So, you know, at its deepest, we estimate about a thousand feet, deep enough that there would be darkness. Uh, in some places, deep enough that you wouldn't, you would have what we call anoxia, which is a lack of oxygen being produced at the bottom there. So, um, a very, very interesting environment. But if you think about coming up from the Southern Sea, what we call the Tethy Seaway, which is now where the Gulf of Mexico is, and heading northward towards what we call the Boreal Sea, you know, sort of shortcutting through the interior seaway, you're gonna look at, you know, you've got your sort of probably saltier, warmer water coming up from the Tethy Seaway. You've got your cooler, less salty water, sort of in that northern, what, what is kind of the Arctic Seaway today. Right. Uh, and then you've got a lot of freshwater input coming in from the Rocky Mountains, and even from from where the Appalachian Mountains are, so it's a very interesting mix. The waters were definitely waters and temperatures and salinities. And so these, everything's changing. These animals, as they were going from north to south, uh, following their food source or going along their migratory routes to maybe have babies. I don't know. Um, they would probably experience some pretty significant temperature change, temperature changes going from north to south or vice versa so these animals had to be pretty um pretty adaptable and you know with a caveat you know where it does doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of variation it does seem like um the mosasaurs were able to tolerate cooler and warmer temperatures a little bit better than a mammal would which because of their reptilian nature i think gives them a little bit of an edge when going back to the sea from the land so if we were to step back evolutionarily and imagine the forebearers of the common ancestor of all of these animals we've been discussing today, it would have been something like a Komodo dragon type of thing, right? At the beginning. Some, some sort of four-legged lizard some sort looking of sort creature of creature that resembled a lizard. <laughs> and, you know, depending on how how those branches occurred and when they occurred. And this is, we were discussing this earlier. I wish we had it on film because I have zero ability to recount a conversation in context so that it makes sense to anybody. Can, can you sort of re-articulate what you were saying about when we were talking? Let's go look at the skulls. This makes it easier to visualize. Okay. And sometimes this is why scientific discussion falls on its face when we try to bring it to a general audience is because we totally nerd out and <laughs> forget that a lot of the people that are participating with us do not have degrees in this particular science. And sometimes we go to light speed right out of a normal universe. <laughs> well, one of the things that one of the questions was asked is how do, uh, uh, snakes sort of fit into uh, this relationship. And some of the earliest ideas about mosasaurs were that they were more related to snakes. There were earliest snakes were in the seaway. Um, and as Ian and Alicia were showing you, the body movements of mosasaurs, kind of like the water monitor, are very snake-like. But in the skull of snakes, 
you can see right down here that there happen to be uh, teeth in the center of the upper part of the mouth. There's some in green back here that are pterygoid teeth and some up front that are palatal teeth. Well, pterygoid teeth is something that is shared with mosasaurs. So if you come over here, we've got a mosasaur skull and you can kind of see the pterygoid teeth here. So what we're looking at is the bottom of the skull. So these are the, the, the teeth on either side of the jaw. And so this is the outside teeth. And if you look here, what's happened is the lower jaw has kind of fallen onto the skull and has mineralized to the rest of the, the bottom half of the skull. But what you're seeing poking out right here along my finger, these are pterygoidal teeth. So that's that, that second set of teeth on the roof of a mosasaur's mouth, but they only appear on the pterygoid bone. So if you look back at the snake, they're doing something kind of snake-like. <laughs> so, and the thing is, monitor lizards like our Komodo dragon or our water monitor that we have, they don't have pterygoid teeth. So this is something that, that mosasaurs share with snakes. Um, neither of them have palatal teeth, but this is something that is definitely shared with snakes. Um, on the other hand, uh, mosasaurs don't, one of the things that snakes have is they have recurved teeth. And even the earliest snakes that were found back in the Jurassic have recurved teeth. Um, and mosasaur teeth are not nearly so recurved. So that's something they have teeth a little more similar to monitor lizards. So there are definitely things that are shared of uh, uh, mosasaurs that are similar to snakes things where they're similar to monitor lizards, which makes it all sort of a very fascinating but potentially confusing sort of issue <laughs> into figuring as out who's related mine. to Which is why in some th ways we look at functional morphology to sort of figure out at least how they lived. Um, so yeah, one of the things that we can sort of compare um, with snakes, and you know, snakes are sort of the rock stars of this whole, you know, I keep coming back to streptostyle, you know, the movable skull parts and and snakes took this idea and just ran with it. And they do some really, really cool stuff with their skull bones, especially, you know, they, they just, I love watching them eat. Um, but mosasaurs kind of were going in that direction, but not quite to the extreme that snakes do. So, yes, we have a question. Have a question. What's the function of the pterygoid teeth? What is the function of the pterygoid teeth? As the, the best way that I can describe it is we think mosasaurs were generally ambush predators, which means that they would lay in wait until a prey item came within um, striking distance. Uh, they would use their tongues to sort of get the scent. Uh, they used a combination of of sort of taste and smell. Um, they, they use their olfactory organs. They've got a special organ on the roof of their mouth, just like snakes, just like monitor lizards. Um, so they have sort of this ability to sort of, in this case, sort of smell what's in the water. And so whatever had that right scent, they would use their tails to create a big burst of speed. Probably were able to, and this is a good, good time to show you the jaw, were probably able to open their jaws fairly wide and then they would snap that jaw shut and catch whatever prey item in their mouth. And what we think the function of these pterygoid teeth would have been, would be once the prey item is in the mouth of the mosasaur, that this top sort of row of teeth, the pterygoid teeth, and remember it's sort of triangular shape, sort of ish, triangular ish. <laughs> so that would actually hold the food item in its mouth while the lower jaws sort of were able to do what we call a ratchet feeding motion. So these guys were able to process their prey items into chunks and then slow them. So in essence, you know... Um, Did you see how I got really excited about that? The, 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 most, the pterygoid teeth are basically helping hold the prey animal because mosasaurs are not chewing and chewing and chewing their, their food. They're trying to spin them around kind of like the snake that we were were watching eat that did not do a good job of throwing it around head first to eat. Um, but 
with of, of basically holding on to the food while their bottom jaws are opening to get more of the animal in and not let them swim away or pull away to escape. So it's basically helping hold the prey in place while they're flipping around so they, they can swallow. And yeah, there, may, their there may have been some back and forth motion to help them break their prey item and, and, uh, into chunks, but probably not as dramatic as something like a, a crocodilian, you know, right. where you see them do sort of death rolls and, you know, really exaggerated back and forth motions. Um, so yeah, that's the pterygoid teeth were, were there to help hold that food item in place because, well, what else did they have to hold their food? They couldn't really use their arms and legs to hold their food down. So, and I'm pretty sure those prey items were not just going to hang out in that animal's mouth and say, I'm breakfast. I wouldn't. <laughs> so we have another question. How strong would the bite force of a Mosasaur be? How strong would, I would say pretty strong. I don't know that I would, would want to experiment with that with my own body. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know that, I'm not sure I've seen a study on actual yeah, pounds per square um, inch. It's not going to be something as strong as, as, uh, and Some in this case, medium large dinosaurs would have think, stronger yeah, bite. Now is a good time to refer to uh, our associate curator of vertebrate paleontology, Mike Everhart. Uh, has he manages a website called? How did he know? Uh, he just, he just showed, up. showed up. Said I'm here. Oh. Hi, Mike. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you want to check out Mike Everhart's um, uh, website. website, thank you. 20, 21st century words are hard. Um, Oceans of Kansas is where I would refer you to. He's got so much information on there. It's an, an incredibly valuable resource. Um, so any questions that I can't think of words to answer right now will probably be on there. Um, Mike, if you're listening, do you know of any studies that looked at the bite force of Mosasaurs? Is there anything in existence out there? Because I can't think of any, uh, but I didn't necessarily focus on on their feeding strategy. So um, all I know, I've learned from you. <laughs> um, and reading your uh, cited articles and all that kind of stuff. So um, they're not, part of the thing, thing is they're not really bone crunchers. So they're not chewing up bone and grinding it up necessarily, but they're, they're definitely strong enough to pierce about any sort of flesh and grab a hold and hold right. on to well, it. Well, and, and the variety of gut contents that we have found, uh, much like fish within a fish, you know, we, we find fossils of mosasaurs that have remains of other vertebrates inside of them. And they the, just about anything. Yeah, the, <laughs> the range of kinds of vertebrates we find in the stomachs of mosasaurs. And invertebrates sometimes. And invertebrates uh, is pretty wide. I mean, if they could get their mouths on it, they would probably try to eat it. So they were what we call generalists, and that's what made them apex predators. What did the Mosasaur eat? Anything it wanted. Anything it wanted. Any other questions? Not right now. So uh, the point being is that, that uh, Mosasaurs are, have things that are very similar to snakes, some uh, features that are very similar to monitor lizards. One of the soft tissue things that's interesting between snakes and monitor lizards. They have something that's shared with their tongues. Oh, the forked tongue? Monitor lizards the have tongue. forked tongues, oh, just uh -huh. like snakes do. Uh, I was thinking that Jacob's organ. Yeah, yes. they have that too. That's Jacob's part Sorgan. of because they have a, a, a forked tongue here. So right. that, that when Ian was talking about getting the, the, the scent for where food is, they can do that. So that's a weird thing that actually ties monitor lizards and, and snakes together and i know that there have been some papers published about mosasaurs and their tongues and i can't remember because it's been about five years since i've read them avidly and I, I i'm embarrassed to admit that but being an educator keeps me really busy sometimes and i don't get to read the publications as often as i once did as a student you warned me about that um so yeah i know that there have been studies on the the um, tongues and sort of soft tissue of the mouth of mosasaurs. Um, so there's definitely work out there. And we go back, uh, like I said, the earliest snakes go back to the Jurassic. But the earliest snakes have been found in Portugal, 
in the United States and in South America. So there is already almost a worldwide distribution when you go back to the earliest snakes. Um, and earliest uh, sort of ancestors to Varana lizards goes back into the Jurassic. So there could have been even a common ancestor between snakes and Varanoid lizards, or there could have been multiple. There might even, not even be monophyletic. You might have multiple origins of snakes. And you may ask yourself, my God, what have I done? <laughs> um, you may be wondering why we're not heavily leaning into snakes in this discussion as well. And that's because we're gonna heavily lean into snakes this afternoon. Um, I hope uh, if, if all is going well, uh, we will be looking uh, up close and personal with some rattlesnakes with Curtis Schmidt. Did I get it right? You, you could totally say There's a name. first time for everything. Yeah, there is. That's amazing. <laughs> Curtis J. Schmidt. I love you, man. Um, he will be... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Please save me. Make me stop. <laughs> Curtis will be coming in and, and talking about Ian Trevethian or I don't know. He'll, he'll, he'll get you back in some, some way or another. Ralph Mouth. <laughs> but the fascinating thing is we're still learning a lot and and uh, monitor lizards, snakes, and mosasaurs are fascinating because they could be really close related, they could be evolution doing things completely independently multiple times, which makes it really fascinating. It's sort of like you were talking about the mosasaur, I mean, the, the our monitor lizard, mm -hmm. almost all monitor lizards, well, all of them say live on land. And a lot of them live in deserts. Some of them live in trees. Some, they live in all kinds of different environments that they, they've adapted to. And we happen to have a water monitor because they spend a lot of time in the water and they go around catching fish and other sorts of things to eat. And one of their adaptations is that they have a highly keeled tail, which allows them to swim really well. It's sort of that D-shaped tail. So it's... And so it's very fascinating because that's... What are you laughing at? Why are when, you laughing at me? When you don't have volume on this thing, your guys' hand motions are just great. It's like the Batusi. <laughs> but so the, so the cool thing is... <laughs> we, we, we... You can't see what's happening behind the camera, but there are things <laughs> happening. Mosasaurus, we know, had highly keeled tails. They had, that, so th that they were swimming with these highly keeled tails. And our water monitor is starting to do the same thing. It's starting to develop a keel so that it can swim. And that's something no other monitor lizard has. No other and monitor has a keel tail. monitors do not like me because one of my favorite things to do when we have them on display in their big water tank is I like to, every chance I get, pull them off of their, their rock that they like to hang out on and drop them in the water so I can watch them swim because they do some really cool stuff. They pull their arms and legs against their bodies mm -hmm. so they become more hydrodynamic. And then they do that that very, what we call ungulatory swimming style. And I can almost, I mean, it's like, I can almost see this guy, the skeleton on the wall here, doing that exact same thing with its arms and legs up against its body and cruising through the water. So um, for me, that's a really cool thing to do. So monitors, not so much. Our <laughs> monitors, could, our water monitor, unlike other monitors, could be converging on mosasaurs. Could be. They might not be related, but they're converging towards a similar lifestyle, and that's why they're getting a keeled tail. Um, but on the other hand, they have things that are very similar, like the forked tongue mm -hmm. and very things that are very snake-like. So we have three groups of animals that could be completely related with a common ancestor back in the Jurassic or they could be evolution taking three different steps in three different directions at the same time, and they converge on a similar lifestyle. So this specimen is an Actinosaurus, and you can look up Actinosaurus on Oceans of Kansas. Um, one of the great things about that website is Mike does an incredible job of not only describing scientifically the specimens, but you also get a full history of who discovered it, where it was found, um, you know, what year, you know, and you can find out about some of these researchers that, you know, if it was many decades ago, who they were, what they were doing, what their background was. So that's really kind of, you know, it gives you a really good, broad swath of information, which, you know, there's never enough of that. So we appreciate the hard work that, that is put into that website. And uh, I, I relied heavy, heavily on it during grad school because it would direct me towards uh, scientific publications that I could cite in my work. 
So that was that, you know, definitely if you are really curious about um, Kansas fossils in general and marine reptiles specifically uh, and want to learn more, check it out because it's well, well stocked with information. Charlie wants to know if they swallow the bones or spit them out. That's a good question. We think often they would uh, actually spit the bones out. We do find different specimens of marine fossils that seem to have been partially digested and then spit out. Um, so we know that they at least did that some of the time. I don't know if they did that all of the time, um, but I do know that we find, uh, it seems like we found some juvenile mosasaur bones that were eaten partially digested and spit out. And I don't know if we know for sure that it was another mosasaur that ate it or not. But were they spit out or did they go through the whole way and not be digested all the way? Because hmm. I remember, I remember somebody in this in this video talked from from previous days talked about how they're very skeptical and they wanted to really learn exactly how things happened and mm. not just guess. I don't know who that was. I don't know mm -hmm. if that could have been. Or when it was. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> um, I'm going to go straight to uh, Oceans of Kansas and try to see if I can find some papers to back that up. Um, so <laughs> you must be careful when you um, <laughs> enthusiastically state something you think in front of another scientist. It, but it, it's it's actually a, an, an interesting thing uh, because uh, physiologically, it, you know, we find that uh, in coprolites of, of terrestrial animals that animals that have uh, really high metabolisms and eat all the time oftentimes bones will go through and not be completely digested. Like dogs and things will eat something and you'll see. I don't know, have we found any coprolites that are attributed to mosasaurs? I don't know. But I, mean, I, I know guess... there's plenty of shark coprolites and I think there are fish coprolites, mm -hmm. but I don't know about marine reptile coprolites. Again, this bears some research. I know, that's, but that, what, where I was headed is that on land, animals- Coprolites with... are poop. Thank you. Help. I was just about to say, can you tell them what copper lights are? Fossil <laughs> poop. Animals with really low metabolism, that most reptiles eat things and they have acidic crocodiles and things have a very acidic stomachs and bones dissolve because the food stays in their guts longer. We, well, and, a week, two weeks, and three muscles weeks. muscles in their guts and do so, incredibly... <laughs> so bones don't make it through... Things bones don't make it through a reptilian system without being dissolved. Whereas, because it's very slow, a much slower digestive process, they stay in the stomach longer. And uh, things like birds and mammals with really high metabolisms, oftentimes they digest things so quickly and they come out the other end, poop so quickly, that a lot of times bones don't get digested. So you might, you'll find them in the poop or the coprolites, whereas you won't for reptilians. And so the, so, if we could only find some mosasaur coprolites that we knew were mosasaur coprolites, we could actually answer that question. So that just made me think of a, a question, and that is, if we're talking about metabolism and how much an animal needs to eat, so let's say that we're talking about a 20-foot-ish 20, 20 long mosasaur, or maybe a 30-foot long mosasaur that is capable of oh, no, migrating up and down, the seaway, how much energy and, and what kind of food budget would an animal like that need? Are they constantly eating? Are they like like our snakes that we can only, you know, we only feed them a couple of times a week even, if, if, if even that, and in the winter time, maybe every two weeks. Um, what kind of, of energy budget would these animals need? That's, that's the big question, and if they were if, if they kept a fairly constant body temperature, it means they're going to have constant needs for food. So, you know, uh, that's the cool thing is understanding metabolism and body size will tell you exactly how much an animal needs to eat. So if we have a 20 foot long animal, if it has a constant body temperature and a higher metabolism, it's going to have to eat every day or at least every other day, probably. Whereas 
if it has a, a, a lower metabolism, it might need to eat once a week. So that, that might explain the Mosasaur's move towards sort of generalism, not being choosy about what they ate. If, if it was in front of them, if it smelled right, um, if, it, you know, if they could get their mouths on it, they would eat it. And was that because they were constantly, um, at least to some degree, keeping a higher metabolism compared to other reptiles that we right. observe today at least. And, and we, we see this even with fish. We know that most fish right, are your typical cold-blooded type of animals, but we know that certain fish like tuna, which are really large and swimming constantly, are able to keep a fairly constant body temperature through their activity. So they keep their metabolism up so by- it's by, their by, muscles so that are heating their bodies. They're heating their bodies. Uh, so they're constantly flexing their muscles and that causes- And really large sharks, like great white sharks, mm -hmm. um, are constantly swimming. So they're keeping their, their body temperature relatively constant through this activity metabolism, which means those are two of the fish that have to eat all the time, or eat a lot more food on a regular basis than smaller because fish. they're relying on those muscles to keep them warmer above, above water temperature. Above water temperature. But in turn, they have to keep moving. They need energy to keep that movement. So they have to eat all the there time. There they go. So, so one idea, possibly. So it's very likely that Mosasaurus you know, probably had to eat a lot more often than, than uh, something with a, 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 a typical reptilian metabolism. Okay, so do we have any more questions that need to be answered or? No, but Mike address? Everhart is giving lots of links okay. that I cannot click on. So check out the links that Mike Everhart is suggesting. Um, he always gives good information. Um, so uh, I would definitely follow those up if you have an interest in what Moses Source were about, what the relationships are. Uh, he's got some great material to add. Um, and I think we're gonna, unless you've got something else you wanna add. You know what, we, you, we, you've talked about stomach contents of things. Yes. Do you wanna go look at those stomach contents over there? Oh, we do have an example of stomach contents. Should we go look at some stomach contents? Let's so just people it, at home can see what we're talking about? We, we can finish up our whole segment here with looking at some stomach contents. All right, lead the well, way. There's some, you know, you left some, Watch I left out some, for on, the the floor. Contents on the floor. Well, there are some stomach contents right here. <laughs> Yeah. We started cleaning it up, but we still have some more work to do. So we just have to sneak, not very far away, but we have to sneak in through our uh, Prairie Oceans exhibit. Long time no see. At which a lot of some fossils came from here that came from uh, Chuck Bonner, who has done lots of collecting of marine animals, fish and mosasaurs and things like that in Western Kansas. Um, and we've got a couple, couple of his fossils that he's collected that are in the exhibit of Prairie Ocean. And here's the coolest one, my opinion only, is we have a mosasaur here. You can see the skull up here and all of the vertebra and Right in the middle of all of this, you see a little red arrow that says Bellumnites. And those are these little cigar-shaped things. And there's about one, two, three, four. There's a dozen of them anyway, that look like they're right in here in the middle of this Mosasaur. So we have the question, it's kind of like the fish within a fish. Did this Mosasaur eat these Bellumnites and have this part of their gut contents? Well. Vellum knights are like squid. They're, they're related to squid, um, but they have these internal cigar-shaped skeletal structures, and they would probably be swimming around oftentimes in groups. So I, I just want to follow up on the coprolite discussion. Uh, Mike Everhart has uh, pointed out that there actually is a coprolite associated with a mosasaur at the Sternberg Museum. We actually have the specimen number. Uh, and he posted some photos of it. So yes, we do have Mosasaur coprolites, or at least what we think are Mosasaur coprolites. What's in them? Um, well, my link isn't working, but definitely check the link. Um, it's not working on my live feed right now because, well, we're live. And um, see what that that uh, that journal article is about, um, because apparently we actually do have some in our collections. 
So I will probably follow this up and we will probably talk about Moses or Copper Lights now because we got them. Once we leave, first place Ian's going is downstairs to collect it. So, but here the point is, here's some invertebrates that, that this Mosasaur was eating. And it looks very likely that it's there because here we have gut contents of a whole group of vellum knights that this thing probably came on a school of them being very stealthy. And as they swam past, took off and got a whole mouthful of them all at once. So, oh, it just shows a whole range of things that Mosasaurs are going to be willing to eat. And here's one that's at least, we not into the copper light stage yet, but kind of like the fish within a fish, was likely in uh, the body cavity. So suggesting what they would have eaten. So back, back to bite strength too. Uh, Mike says that um, there are no studies of bite, bite strength that he knows of either, but um, flexibility of the skull would preclude a pretty strong bite. Right. And some of these animals were very, very big. Uh, the animal that we were looking at just now, and even this animal, is on the fairly small side. Um, we've got jaws of, of tylosaurs that are really, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, burly, uh, robust. Um, just, you know, the, the fragments are, you know, as big around as this, you know, and that's just the jaws. You know, they're, they're very, substantial jaws. So um, what Mike is saying is they got big uh, and the flexibility of the skull, um, you know, combined with that size and probably the bite strength that, you know, the way they were able to move their skulls, you wouldn't want to go there. Definitely not. The cool animals, but I'm glad we don't have to deal with them today. You want to be in a big boat. Yes, you would need a bigger one. All so. right. <laughs> So I think that'll do it for our, our segment this morning. Um, we will probably come back to this and I will look up some of the specimens that were referred to in our discussion and um, we will take this where it wants to go um, if there's interest. Uh, be sure to tune in this afternoon at 2 p.m. Central Time where we will be working with up close with rattlesnakes um, uh, I've heard that we will be looking at their skulls, talking about some of the similar things and comparisons that we've talked about this morning. Um, as always, please share our live feeds when they're no longer live. Like, comment. Uh, we like the interaction. We're hoping that you're enjoying the things that we're bringing to you. Um, always feel free to, to shoot us comments uh, or suggestions for things you'd like to talk about. We are working on new and exciting topics for the upcoming days and weeks. Um, in all honesty, I was only prepared for two weeks because I couldn't, I didn't think that the world would possibly shut down for two whole weeks and go beyond that, but here we are. So we're working on trying to find new and sort of different things to bring you. And I will have a much better idea uh, after this afternoon of where we're going to go with that. But I'm excited and I can't quite tell you what we're up to yet. So, um, until this afternoon, I'm Ian. I'm Reese. And we'll see you soon. Thank you for tuning in. Keep monitoring the situation. Oh my God.